Hey, welcome to Mini Beginner's Crash Course. My name is Lisa Jung, and I'm a developer advocate at Elastic. This course is for developers who want to get started with Elasticsearch and Kibana. In Season 2, we're building a full-stack JavaScript app that could search for earthquake data stored in Elasticsearch. In the previous episode, we connected our Node.js server to Elasticsearch hosted on Elastic Cloud. Next, it's time to think about ingesting data into Elasticsearch. For our project, we'll be retrieving the data from the USGS API and ingesting it into Elasticsearch. But before we could do this, we need to plan for efficient data storage and search performance in Elasticsearch. In this episode, we'll assess the API data to determine what data we need discover if we need to transform the data to fit our use case, and decide on the desired mapping for efficient storage and search of data. So let's talk about the relevant resources for this episode. All the links to these resources are included in the description box. As mentioned earlier, we'll be getting the data from the USGS Earthquakes API page, more specifically, all earthquakes data from the past 30 days. So be sure to have this page pulled up as we're going over it. Next, we have the Earthquake Catalog documentation. This contains a description of fields included in the API. If you need clarification on the acronyms or want details about certain fields, use this documentation as your reference. Throughout the episode, we'll be talking about mapping quite a bit. We covered mapping in the previous season, so I'll be breezing through this. So if you need a refresher on this topic, check out this blog or the workshop shown here. We'll also be referring to the Elasticsearch documentation on field types when talking about mapping. You'll find this resource really helpful when assigning field types to your data. All right, so before we get started, let's review the final outcome of the app we're building. Our app allows a user to search for earthquakes. They could specify the type, magnitude, location, and date range to retrieve the data that they want. When the user clicks on the search button, the search results are displayed as cards. And each card displays information about one earthquake. This includes type, time, location, latitude, longitude, magnitude, depth, significance, and event URL of an earthquake. The information shown here is what we need from the USGS API. We'll store this information in Elasticsearch in the form of documents and each document will contain information about one earthquake. Now that we know what we want, let's examine the data structure of the Earthquake API. So go to the USGS Earthquake API page and scroll down to the output section. And the output displays a data structure of a typical earthquake object found in the API. From here, scroll down on the output to view the field features. The field features contains an array of objects. Each object contains information about one earthquake, and it lists the name and the data type of fields. In step one, we determine what information we need to store in Elasticsearch, and you'll see that the object properties and geometry contain the information that we're looking for. For comparison, I put the earthquake object from the API and the search results card side by side. At first glance, you'll see that the earthquake object contains way more information than we need. To save storage, we'll only store the fields for mag, place, time, URL, sig, type, and coordinates array, which includes longitude, latitude, and depth in that order. The API fields that correspond to the info on the card are highlighted in the same colors. When you compare the two, for majority of these, the info from the API is identical to the info displayed in the search results. However, there are a few that are not the same. For example, let's compare the field time in the API earthquake object with the information about time on our card. You'll see that the field time in the earthquake object is in Unix epoch time. However, time on the results card displays a human readable timestamp. To achieve this outcome, we'll convert the Unix epoch time into a human readable timestamp, then store the transformed information in the field at timestamp in Elasticsearch. Now, don't worry, this will become more clear in the next episode. 
All right, let's move on to the field coordinates. You'll see that the search results card has fields called latitude, longitude, and depth. In the API earthquake object, the values of these fields are contained in an array called coordinates and are not labeled as such. To make it easier to identify this information, we'll create fields for latitude, longitude, and depth in Elasticsearch. Then we'll store corresponding info from the coordinates array into its respective fields. Then we'll store latitude and longitude into an object called coordinates to keep this information together as a pair. Note that in Elasticsearch, the abbreviation lat should be used for latitude and long should be used for longitude. Again, this will become more clear in the next episode, so don't worry if you're not quite understanding this yet. Okay, so we just figured out how we should transform the retrieved API data before ingesting it into Elasticsearch. Next, we'll figure out how to ingest the transformed data using the smallest disk space while maximizing our search performance. And this is when customizing your mapping come into play. Mapping defines how a document and its fields are indexed and stored, and it does that by assigning types to fields being indexed. Depending on the assigned field type, each field is indexed and primed for different types of requests. This is why mapping plays an important role in how Elasticsearch stores and searches for data. Now, I'll be breezing through this section, so be sure to review the mapping episode from Season 1 if some of these concepts are not clear to you. To make this process easier, I have created a table that displays the name of the field, description of the field, typical values contained in the field, the purpose this field will serve, and the desired mapping I have chosen for the field. So let's go through each field and determine why I chose certain field types for each field. When you take a look at the typical values column in the table, you'll see that these fields either contain numeric or string values. So let's take a look at the fields that contain numeric values first. There are various field types that can be assigned to numeric fields, and the field type you choose will depend on the type of value a field contains and for what purpose you'll be using the field. For example, let's look at the field coordinates. This field is an object that contains the fields lat and long within it. Let's talk about what purpose this field will serve. The information in this field will be displayed on the search results card. It'll also be used to mark earthquake hotspots on a heap map in episode 10. This type of operation requires geo-based queries, and the field coordinates should be typed as geopoint in order for this to work. Next, we have the fields depth and mag. If you look at the typical values for these fields, they contain decimal values. The values of these fields will be displayed in the search results card. So we'll map these fields as float. Next, we have a field called sig. When you look at the typical values for this field, it consists of integers that range between 0 to 1000. And the value of this field will be displayed in the search result card. Now, we want to choose the field type that will store integers using the smallest disk space. So this is where the elastic documentation for numeric field types become really handy. The typical value for the field sig is an integer between 0 and 1000, and the field type that will allow us to store this data using the smallest disk space is short. So we'll assign the field sig with the field type of short. Okay, so let's talk about the field time. The value of this field will be displayed in the search results card. It'll also be used to search for earthquakes that have occurred within the chosen date range. To do so, we'll run range queries on this field, so we'll assign the field type date. Next, we'll go over the fields that contain string data types. We went over string data types pretty extensively in Season 1, so watch the episode if you need a refresher on the jargons that I'll be using.
By default, string fields are mapped twice as text and keyword, and each field type is optimized for different type of search. In case where you don't need both field types, the default setting is wasteful. It'll slow down indexing and take up more disk space. When deciding on a string field type, make sure you know what purpose this field will be serving so you could choose the correct field type. This field will be used for three purposes. The value of this field will be displayed on the search results card. It'll also be used for full text search, meaning when a user types in a location, the user input will be searched against this field to retrieve the earthquake data the user is looking for. Now, this field will also be used for aggregation in episode 10. We'll run aggregation on this field to yield a table of 10 location with the highest frequency of earthquakes. Since we need to run both full text search and aggregation on this field, we'll assign both text and keyword field types. Next, we have the field type. The value of this field will be displayed on the search results card. It'll also be used for exact search. When a user searches for a specific type of quake, the user input is ran against the field type to retrieve relevant search results. The user is prompted to select a type from a list of options. Therefore, we can perform exact searches on this field and we'll assign the field type keyword. Lastly, we have a field URL. This field is only displayed on a card and it's not used for search. Therefore, there's no need to create inverted index or doc values for this field. So we'll disable this field. In this episode, we figured out how we want to transform the data before ingesting into Elasticsearch. We also came up with a desired mapping to efficiently store and search data in Elasticsearch. Next, we'll set up Elasticsearch for data transformation and data ingestion. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.